All right, radio listeners, today we have a special guest in Vicki Behenna. Vicki Behenna is the mother of First Lieutenant Michael Behenna. We've been talking about his story for several years now. And Vicki, I want to welcome you back to the Conscience of Kansas radio program. And Paul, thank you so much again for having me. Well, I'm happy to do so. You know, this is one of those stories, I got to tell you, uh, Vicki, today we're running video, we're getting ready to uh, really send out through the airwaves to tens of thousands of new Kansans and really Colorado, Nebraska people that have never heard me talk about this before. And so we're in a bigger venue, and I want to get the word out, and I'm so appreciative of your time. I wonder if we could start a little bit by, for those that have never heard of the story of what happened to Michael Behenna, if you could walk folks once again through his story. Sure, uh, and I'll, I'll give you a, a, a kind of a abbreviated version of what happened. But basically, uh, Michael graduated from uh, college here in uh, Oklahoma. He received a commission as a second lieutenant. He was assigned to, after Ranger uh, training and after having gotten his Ranger tab uh, to the 101st Airborne Division at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. He deployed to Iraq in September of '07. Uh, things rocked along okay in the deployment until about uh, April 21st in particular, uh, 2008. On that date, Michael and his platoon were out on patrol in uh, Iraq, around Beji, Iraq. Um, the platoon was hit by an IED. That IED explosion killed two of Michael's soldiers, uh, seriously injured the uh, company medic and the platoon sergeant, where they had to be medevaced out of the country. After that attack, Michael read a military intelligence report that identified that al-Qaeda in Iraq was responsible for the attack on his platoon, and in particular, a man by the name of Ali Mansour was a member of that al-Qaeda cell. Uh, Michael knew Ali Mansour because he was with the local Iraqi police department. Part of Michael's responsibility was to help rebuild and secure the Iraqi police station where Ali Mansour worked. Uh, because it had been blown up before. Mm-hmm. So he was familiar with Ali Mansour. So he read the report that Ali Mansour, as I said, was a member of that al-Qaeda cell, that his role in the cell was to report on the movement of coalition forces in the desert and to transport explosives. Uh, after that reading that, Michael and the platoon uh, went out and detained Ali Mansour, working with the local sheikh in, in Albatoma, which was a little village where uh, Mansour lived. They took him into custody. Ten days later, Michael heard that Mansour was going to be released. Michael went to the uh, intelligence group there on the FOB and asked them to do another interrogation because Michael read the four interrogation reports that had been done at Cobb Spiker and realized that interrogators hadn't asked Ali Mansour anything about his ties to al-Qaeda or his role in the IED attack that killed two American soldiers. Uh, on the FOB, they do another what they call a rescreening, and they determine that Mansour ad- admitted uh, associating with known uh, terrorists that they knew were operating in that area. But Michael was told it didn't matter what Mansour said; he'd been ordered released from command. And then Michael's company- let me let me jump in for just a sure. second, Vicky, because there's a couple things of interest. And the first thing I want to make sure is that radio listeners, I, I want you to go to the website defendmichael.com for several reasons. And one is that you can read a lot of what we're going to recap. And you can also get a lot of peripheral information that's important to get to know Michael Behenna. First, this was a guy that uh, was on the rise. His star was on the rise as far as a military officer. He had been promoted. He had wonderful, glowing evaluations and had been serving admirably over here before this event took place. And so I think that's very important to look not only at his service and how he should be evaluated when it comes to any kind of allegation that's leveled against uh, a military personnel, because allegations get leveled against personnel in the field of operation all the time. Also, to kind of see what kind of person, when there is a specific charge of criminal uh, action, you know, this was a guy that was smart. The military liked him, and you can see that in these reviews. He was serving well, so he was a military asset, something the military needs in time of war, people that can lead others that are getting things done. 
And now you get to the point where, to me in your story, of, of, of the account, Vicky, things seem really hinky to me. Uh, that's the word I will use. The idea that military intelligence didn't know about this Ali Mansur, because I've talked to other military personnel since the last time we spoke, and there really hasn't been a whole lot of question that this Ali Mansur was a bad guy, was an Al-Qaeda operative. Uh, you know, the, their their questions really pertain was, you know, did he do the actions of of that uh, really did so much harm to Behenna's, uh his group or not? But the fact that this guy was a terrorist, a terrorist actor, I've had lots of people now that have told me, no doubt, this guy was a bad guy. And and so continue from where you're at, Vicki. Yes, uh, and I'm glad you pointed out about Michael's uh, evaluation. I mean, they, they wanted him promoted to captain. They wanted him to go to the first captain career course as soon as he got back. So, right, he wasn't a screw-up. He wasn't somebody that yeah. the Army was trying to get rid of. Right. Um, in any event, you know, Michael tries to do everything he can to keep Mansoor in custody and uh, to no avail. And then Michael's company commander makes uh, what I think is a tragic decision, not only failed Michael, uh, obviously, for what happens next, but Michael's company commander tells Michael to return Mansoor home. Well, Mansoor has, or Michael has Mansoor in the back of one of the trucks, and he is trying to get his head around, what am I going to do? Now Mm -hmm. this guy, if I release him without trying to further question him about where the explosives are or who else is involved in the cell, he's going to act with complete immunity. He's going to be able to kill me, my platoon, and I'm not, nobody's going to be able to do anything about it. Right. So Michael makes a decision to do a field questioning of Mansoor, and he takes him, and nobody disputes this. Michael takes him, his interpreter, and another soldier, and Michael begins asking Mansoor questions. Um, you know, where are the explosives? Who's financing it? Michael also knew when he detained Mansoor that he was tra- Mansoor was traveling back and forth to Syria. So Michael was asking questions about that. Well, uh, you know, when, let me jump out with one other thing. Sure. Because, because this is, again, this is bizarre. This is really almost Twilight Zone at this point. The idea that they would... Uh, in any kind of a situation like this, it would be it's not only bad form, but it's it's just bizarre that they would put this guy who is believed and suspected to be responsible for uh, deaths of soldiers that Behenna is over and working with, that they would put him in the custody of Behenna. It's, it's just odd and, and strange. And they would have to know that uh any human being in Behenna's situation, in Michael's situation, would be under tremendous strain, tremendous stress. That would it would be natural uh, to think that he would be worried about the future of his men, worried about failing them if he didn't do the second interrogation, if he didn't do everything possible. It, I, you know, that right there, they set up for everything that happens afterwards, no matter how you interpret it, right. they, they put this into motion. Right, right. I, I feel that way oh, I do too. very strongly, and I've tried to get from the military, of course, to no avail at this point in time, why the decision was made, first of all, to release Monsoon. And I'd like to know who ordered his release. And I'd also like to know uh, why in the world somebody would put Monsoon back in Michael's custody, in the same platoon's custody. Uh, you know, police officers don't even do that. I mean, if a police officer is involved in a partner shooting, one of the partners gets killed, the police officer that was there on the scene has nothing to do with the suspect. Bring him into custody, take him to court because of the emotions involved. And, and from all aspects, from all the evidence, Michael was distraught over the deaths of these two soldiers. I mean, he took it very, very hard. Right. And this is, again, only two weeks after uh, the incident, um, Michael was given... Mansoor to return him home. So Michael does try the field interrogation, and during the interrogation, Michael takes uh, Mansoor to a culvert, and there are reasons for that that are, are you know I'm not going to go into right now. But during the trial, there was evidence about why he chose the culvert that he did. In any event, Michael sits Mansoor on some rocks. He begins asking him questions. At one point in time in the questioning, Michael understands a little bit of Arabic and knew he kept saying, "I don't know anything. I'm innocent." And um, at one point in time, Monsoor says something Michael didn't understand, so he turned his head to the left to look at his translator because his translator was standing behind Michael and to his left. 
when Michael turned his head, he said he heard a rock hit the culvert by the side of his head. Um, and when he turned back to look at Mansoor, he's no longer seated on a rock. He's now standing. His arm is outstretched. Michael thinks he's reaching for his weapon, so he shoots a control pair, and he kills Mansoor. And, of course, Michael, uh, that happens in, in the first part of May of 2008. Michael is charged with the premeditated murder of Ali Mansoor in August of 2008 goes to trial in February of 2009 in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And the prosecutor's theory was that Michael was mad at Mansoor because he had killed two of mm-hmm. his soldiers mm-hmm. and that he, he executed him in the head. Uh, Michael's uh, defense was that I shot, but I shot in self-defense because I believed he was reaching for my weapon. The forensic evidence turns out to be very important. The government presented no forensic evidence. Uh, The defense presented the forensic evidence, which is odd uh, to begin with. But the defense forensic experts, I noted that the trajectory of the bullets were horizontal and parallel to each other, inconsistent with somebody standing above somebody and shooting them in the head while they're seated. Um, They also noted that uh, the first shot could not have been the shot to the right. And I I guess I'd explain that very quickly. There are two bullet wounds, one under the right armpit and one in the right temple. The government's theory, of course, was that Michael just shot him in the right temple and killed him. The forensic expert says that was a killing blow, and there was no explanation for how the shot got under the right rib. So they believe that Monsoor uh, was standing at the time he was shot, that the first shot was under the right armpit, that the right arm was up or somehow out of the path of the bullet because there was no injury, no damage to the right arm. It wasn't down by his side. So they believe, the defense experts believe, that the first shot uh, went in under the right armpit. The second shot is the body starting to fall to the ground, hits in the right temple, and that Michael acted in self-defense. We have forensic evidence that supported Michael's version of how the shooting took place. And uh, and go ahead, keep going, because you're going to get to the part where I want to stop you, so keep going. Yeah, the government had their own forensic expert. Mm -hmm. And after the defense forensic experts testified, they all gathered in a room. I'm talking about the government forensic expert and the prosecutors. And the government forensic expert told the prosecutors, I don't think your theory's right. I don't believe that he was an execution in in the head. I believe, and he gives them a demonstration much like the defense forensic experts had just testified to, that he was standing, the first shot enters under the right armpit, the right arm's out of the path of the bullet, uh, the second shot hits him in the right temple as he falls to the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they, the prosecutors, don't disclose that information to defense counsel, that their own forensic expert agrees with the defense version of how the shooting occurred, consistent with self-defense. And, you know, th- that's amazing that that didn't take place. And you're absolutely right. I think you have uh, your work and what you do, you you're uh, you have knowledge of this. I'm a former Kansas police chief. I've been in court trials. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. When the prosecutors come in to prosecute or murder or any kind of shooting, they lead with yeah. the forensic evidence. That's why you have CSI show even created, even though it's fantasy. It's based on the fact that that's how you go in with the facts. You use science to uh, to back you up. And so the, the fact that they weren't going to give out that scientific evidence makes me think the whole trial was a sham. And I think the fact of the sham started when his commanders put him in this untenable situation. I think it's a domino effect at that point where you have bad decision making happening and then you have a cover up of the bad decision making happening uh, in in what I believe has been a politically correct war to start with. Right. If, if this had been any time. If Michael had been serving in even Vietnam, but Korea, World War II, World War One, we wouldn't be here. He, right. would, he would be at home with right. you. And so, uh, and, and Michael, unfortunately, and you know this as well, uh, is not the only soldier in this kind of predicament. But, uh, you know, I think he got... Uh, screwed over so you went to the appeal process he got 25 was sentenced to 25 years yes and and then you were you know he's taken to fort leavenworth prison here in kansas and uh you guys have been working to try to get him some justice through the appeal system tell folks a little bit about that 
Yeah, well, you know, and our primary argument was that, uh, and I, I didn't finish the part of it about the government prosecutors after their forensic expert told them that he thought Michael's story was consistent with the forensic evidence and that the man was standing at the time he was shot. And it was an execution in the head. They sent their forensic expert home so he couldn't testify. And so the appeal process has all been about this failure to turn over uh, evidence that was helpful to the defense. I mean, prosecutors have an ethical responsibility yes. and a constitutional obligation to turn over exculpatory evidence or favorable evidence, and right. they didn't do that in this case. We also have been arguing because the military judge instructed the jury on self-defense, but in a very, very uh, strange way. It's a very difficult instruction to read and understand, So, and it's a misstatement of the law on self-defense. So we've gone all the way through, you know, we asked the military judge for a new trial. He denied that. We went through the Army court. The Army upheld the conviction. All three judges did. Then we went to the uh, Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. And, uh, you know, we had that argument in April of last year. I, I really, really believed, based upon the Brady information and the fact that the judge gave an improper self-defense instruction that we were home free and that Michael was going to get a new trial. They denied that in July uh, in a very um, a disputed split decision. Uh, the court found that the instruction was erroneous, a statement of the law. They found that the evidence should have been turned over, but they found it immaterial because the Army court said that Michael could have lost his right to self-defense because at the time he was doing the questioning, he had his service weapon out and, and pointed, trained, on Monsoor. And so based upon that, Michael lost his right to self-defense. Now, I don't, that that yeah, I don't understand over. that at all. In my, in my opinion, the and of course, this is a 3-2. You lose this by a 3-2 vote. That's right, one vote. One vote. And, you know, I would just ask radio listeners out in Radioland to think about that. One vote. And Michael goes home. You know, this is it's over. This is over. One right. vote. I don't know. I don't. I can't imagine how big a letdown that was. To oh, see how, how it close. was devastating. Mm-hmm. It was just devastating. And, and the way the way it was said. I mean, I, I'm sitting there believing that this court cares about soldiers and the lives of soldiers, and to tell a mother of an American soldier that her son should have died that day when a terrorist tried to take his weapon from him is, mm-hmm. is, uh, and that he had no right to defend himself is, is just, I mean, it gets me upset yeah. when I say it out loud. It's just hard for me to believe that an American court would say that about an American soldier. Yeah, well, anyway. and, you know, every single, uh, and, you know, you're talking over here in Kansas, we have tons and tons of military people. When I was broadcasting this at the very beginning, I was getting emails from soldiers at Fort Riley, and, and they were like, man, you know, if this can happen to Michael Behenna, this can happen to me, and I'm shipping out next week. You know, that right. kind of that kind of stuff, and uh, it's a travesty of justice, and here you're at a point where you, you almost— Get just get justice. You know the situation with Michaels. You could you could make the argument. Okay, he shouldn't have made this interrogation. Maybe he wasn't given orders to right. do that. But in traditional times, we'd be looking at a demotion in rank. You might be looking at the worst case. They they say go home. You're done. That's right. But, but they don't take your whole life away. Right. You know, Michael. I say that. You know, if if he has to serve his full term, he's going to be forty. Something like forty years old, right? You know, he doesn't get to enjoy you know, all the things that I've enjoyed as a as a forty three year old that he deserves. He deserves right. to have that. He deserves to be able to go home. What are What are you doing now? What's What can we do now? Yes, uh, it, you know, we are going to try to go to the Supreme Court. I, I spent a lot of time talking to lawyers in D.C. and and professors of law at at uh, law schools. And we've put together a team that is going to try to uh, pose this question, and that is, you know, how can a soldier lose a right to defend himself in a combat zone uh, to the Supreme Court and see if they'll take the case? You know, we have probably a 1% chance that the Mm -hmm. Supreme Court will take this case. But we feel it's important for all soldiers and Marines that are in combat zones to do it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to. In the meantime, uh, you know, I am asking people to write and write and write again to the Secretary of the Army, 
to their elected politicians, that being their state senator, their congressman, and even the president, and ask him to commute or pardon Michael. I mean, I don't think anybody thinks that Michael is some crazed, wild man that is going to go out once he's released and commit horrific crimes. No, look at his record. You look at his record, you you know that's not the case. And there are people with juice, I call. Uh, we had Lieutenant Colonel Alan West on the program to talk about Michael Behenna. And, and we talked about that. There are people out there. But uh, if people want to write in, do they? if they go to defendmichael.com, uh, you know, one thing I ask people to go there, and I'm looking into our cameras here because we're going to go to, to YouTube and everywhere video will allow us to with this interview. Go to defendmichael.com and donate money to the cause here because it is so expensive to try to, to fund going to the Supreme Court and everything else that is being done to try to free Michael Behenna. But uh, is there also the addresses for them to send letters? Like if they want to send to the president, you know, we have a president that could could feasibly give Michael Bahena a pardon. And yeah. and we have a president, you know, that I say, and there's no politics in this interview, but very well may be in his final term when presidents do give out pardons. Is this an option on the table? Yes, sure. Then people need to email the president, no matter whether you like him or don't like him, you have a president here that has the opportunity to do something right, that's absolutely right, no matter if you're Republican, Democrat, then uh, we'll put up the address on, at IbbotsonUSA.com, along with the link to DefendMichael.com. You need to go there if this is the first time you've ever heard about this story. Once you read the details, then you're going to become a champion of this cause, and we need as many people as possible. And and Vicki, you're, you're getting heard by some tremendous people within this part of the state that when they believe in a cause, they'll give it all their, they'll, they'll give it all they got. And, and so it's, it's a really uh, wonderful to be able to share the story. Do you have any party thoughts before we sign off with you today? No, just, I, I, I need, I need people's help. I mean, I know it was the voice of the American public that freed the border patrol agents mm-hmm. and pressured president Bush to free them and commute their sentences. And I need that voice right now. I mean, this clearly is not a legal fight we're fighting. We're fighting a political fight. And the only way I'm going to be able to get the administration to pay attention and do something right by Michael is if people make some noise and say, look, just let the guy go. Enough is enough. It would be almost four years in March that he was incarcerated Mm -hmm. for killing an al-Qaeda operative in a combat zone. Yeah. And I think four years is plenty. Well, absolutely. Uh, I agree with you, uh, Vicki. Uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on today. You, you. You've had to relive giving the details out, but you're doing what needs to be done. We want to help in any way possible. I've written articles in Kansas papers about this. We've done YouTube. We've had you on. And I feel tremendously lacking in my effort to help try to do something. I've sent to Michael letters myself and folks can do that. But right now they need to put heat on uh, to get it out there in the public, make it a media frenzy story and, and get Michael Bahena back home. That would be wonderful, Paul. And God bless you for doing that with us and helping us in this fight. Very happy to do so. Vicki Bahena. Thank you so much again, folks. We're closing out with the website, defendmichael.com, defendmichael.com, defendmichael.com. Thank you so much, uh, Vicki Behenna, for coming on the Conscience of Kansas radio program. Thank you so much. All righty. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.